The Trans-Siberian Railway, or TSR, is the longest railway line in the world. Spanning a length of over 9,200 kilometers, it runs from the city of Moscow in the west to the city of Vladivostok in the east. This strategic railway network was built between 1891 and 1916. During World War II, the Trans-Siberian Railway played a vital role. After June of 1941, the Soviet Union received almost 50% of the land lease supplies from the US via this railway line. It was called the Pacific Route. Goods were moved from US West Coast ports and the total distance was 6,000 miles. The entire journey took approximately 20 days. From Vladivostok, nearly 400,000 railway carloads of goods were transshipped via the Trans-Siberian Railway to the industrial heart of the Soviet Union. Even after Japan went to war with the United States, despite numerous German complaints, Japan allowed Soviet ships to sail between US and Vladivostok unmolested. As a result, the Pacific Route and the TSR became the safest connection between the United States and the Soviet Union. From 1941, the TSR also played an important role in relocating Soviet industries from European Russia to Siberia in the face of the German invasion, and later the TSR transported Soviet troops west from the Far East to take part in the Soviet counteroffensive in December of 1941. In this video, I'm exploring the possibilities of a concentrated German air attack on the Trans-Siberian Railway in November of 1941 and after to restrict the transfer of men and materials from the Soviet Far East. This is a map of the Soviet railways during World War II. The European part of the Soviet railways starts at Omsk. From Omsk, already two lines branch out to Chelyabinsk and to Sverdlovsk, which is today Yekaterinburg. Omsk is approximately 2,240 km away from Moscow in a direct line. Considering that a bomber for such raid would need to start from a well-prepared permanent airfield and then would need to avoid the anti-aircraft regions, the effective trip would be approximately 3,000 km. The Luftwaffe simply did not have an airplane that could make this trip in 1941. However, the Luftwaffe intelligence had identified three major railway linking between Siberia and European Russia. Of these three lines, the southern route, so the route between Chelyabinsk and Moscow, offered possibilities even to the extent of interrupting land lease shipment to the Soviet Southern and Central Front. German intelligence reduced the problem of severing this Soviet supply and communication artery to the destruction of only three railway bridges. From Chelyabinsk in the Urals to Moscow there are more than three railway bridges so I'm not sure to which three railway bridges the German intelligent thought of. But what if the Germans had decided to go after these bridges? Well, the Luftwaffe could have striked the railway bridges between Moscow and Omsk already in the autumn of 1941. Dietrich Peltz was a German World War II Luftwaffe bomber pilot and later he became the youngest general of the German army. 
As a pilot, he flew approximately 320 combat missions, including roughly 130 as a bomber pilot on the Eastern Front. Peltz was appointed Staffelkapitän, so squadron leader, of the Krankgeschwader so Bomber Wing 77 in November of 1940. Less than two weeks later, he was given command of the second group of the Kampfgeschwader 77. With this unit, he relocated to East Prussia in June of 1941, in the prelude of Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union. He flew long-range missions against targets in the northern sector. His group undertook a number of 1,000-mile round trips from their bases in East Prussia to attack the Leningrad-Moscow railway line. They flew missions against railway stations, marshalling yards, canals and the log gates. Here, Peltz was instrumental in developing accurate bombing techniques, allowing his group to achieve success against precision targets which previously could be achieved only with a much larger bomber force. The pinpoint accuracy often resulted in Soviet installations being out of action for days, if not for weeks. So, this particular Luftwaffe unit would have been able to attack the TSR in late 1941. It had the combat experience and with additional fuel in large 900 liter drop tanks the sufficient range as well. It could thus prevent or at least slow down the arrival of the fresh Soviet divisions from the Far East in late 1941. To cut the TSR and deploying troop movements for a period of time before a major German offensive would have been possible in 1942 and 1943 as well. I'm talking about multiple attacks against tunnels and bridges along this strategic railway line. The Luftwaffe could have used a new weapon, a new bomb site to realize this. The Karl Zeiss Lotfenrohr 7 or Lotfe 7. Lot meant vertical and Fenrohr meant telescope. It appeared in the spring of 1942 and became a primary bomb site used in most Luftwaffe level bombers. It was similar to the United States Northern bomb site but much simpler to operate and maintain. The Lotfe 7 was dramatically simple, consisting of a single metal box containing the vast majority of the mechanism, with a tube extending out the bottom with a mirror that reflected the image of the target into a small telescope in the box. Operation was fairly similar to the northern bomb site. The bombardier would first locate the target in the bomb site and continue to adjust the dials until it remained motionless in the eyepiece. This allowed the bomb site to calculate the wind speed from the cancelled out drift rate, which in turn allowed to make an accurate calculation of ground speed. The Lotfe 7 was normally installed near the nose of the aircraft, with the mirror tube projecting through the fuselage to the outside of the aircraft. And how accurate this device was, you might ask? Well, on the 17th of July 1942, the second group of the Count Geschwader, so Bomber Wing 55, gave a realistic demonstration of the accuracy of the device. The handcars of the group clinically took out the vital Rostov bridge across the lower Don River with several hits from a height of 5000 meters. This single strike 
effectively severed the Soviet main line of communication. Continuous large-scale air attacks on TSR bridges would have also diverted significant troops into defending this strategic artery as well. Precision long-range air attacks on Soviet bridges would have been possible given the range and aircraft available. Were there alternative methods of moving troops and materials other than the TSR? Would the delay to operations be more significant that I have calculated with a more dramatic strategic implications? Or given Russian resilience and an endless supply of manpower, would the damage have had no major military impact whatsoever? Soviet engineers had the ability to build replacement pontoon bridges and bypass bridges. Lashing up a ferry service is not hard to do and might already have ferry assets in place. To make the bridge destruction work and have a significant effect, the German Air Force would have had to attack day after day for a prolonged period of time to keep the bridges unusable. And they have had to achieve high level of accuracy in the teeth of defenses that would only improve and increase over time. The German losses would have been very high.